presentation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life. And he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting Bible? Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. In the Church of Christ, we teach that the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle. We'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white, regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. You're traveling to another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop... And as the church continues to grow, people are driving miles to hear the truth. Yes, I drove an hour to get here, but it's worth it, and we try to do it every week. I think we've definitely developed a reputation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life and he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. What the? What the? After losing the debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin. You have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending, was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. In the Church of Christ, we teach that the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle. We'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here, and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white, regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Glad you're with us tonight. We've got a good uh, study going, I believe, uh, of interest to you. But we want to always start off with our content information, and so that's what we're going to do. We meet at... Uh, to the Boulevard in uh, Eden, and if you are in the area, we'd be glad for you to come out and visit with us. We have our Bible studies on Thursday nights at 7 p.m., and uh, we 
uh, assemble for worship and for Bible study on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. And so if you can come out and be with us, we'll be glad for you to do that very thing, 276-340-2653. Or wordlord at gmail.com if you'd like to uh, email me and uh, ha have Bible discussions that way. we would be glad to hear from you. Uh, also, uh, if you're in the Martinsville area, uh, H-23 Starling Avenue, I think Mark gave this information, uh, H-23 Starling Avenue in Martinsville, 120 American Legion in Danville. And, uh, you know, those are, uh, you know, folks, these are, Good opportunity for you to come out and study the Bible, uh, meet friends, meet, meet some individuals that you probably uh, haven't met before, but you might be surprised at who you do know. And uh, members of the Church of Christ are, are known in the community. I mean, we're, uh, you know, we're trying to be uh, a good influence in our society, and so this is the, the way the, the Word works. And so when you come and you visit us, you realize, hey, that, that person's a member of the Church of Christ. And hopefully you'll say, you know what? I should have known they're a member of the Church of Christ because uh, of the way they act, the way they, the way they talk, the way they behave and so forth. And so and if you see something contrary to that, if you know someone who's a member of the Church of Christ and, and living contrary to the way the Bible should, uh, you know, if we, we find out about it, we correct it because we don't want the, uh, we don't want people's lifestyles to, to conflict with what the Bible is saying. And so we want to be a, a pure picture uh, of, of Christ and representing of uh, the Lord's body to all. And so come out and, and study the Bible with us and uh, we'll, be glad to, we'll be glad to make your acquaintance and uh, get to know you a little better. Tonight we're going to be uh, discussing the real story. You know, oftentimes when you hear information, you you say, you know, well, that that's kind of, Interesting, but then when you hear like the rest of the story, or Paul Harvey used to say that you know the rest of the story, you say, "Wow, that's I, I can't believe that. I, I never would have uh, thought that, or that was amazing. <clears throat> maybe it might have scared you. You know, maybe when you realize just how bad things were, it was kind of scary. I've been reading a book called Deceivers and Dreamers, and it's about individuals that uh, uh, basically changed our society by what they did. Some of them for good, some of them bad, and just the, uh, 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 the circumstances surrounding their lives, like guys like Desi Arnaz and, and really the way you watch television today is really a, a, a tip of the hat to Desi Arnaz. Uh, he basically invented the rerun. And so um, uh, when you think about what he did and how he accomplished something, you go, wow, when you realize the rest of the story, the back story, you realize, hey, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. You know, I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. But now I can see how, how great of an influence that uh, these individuals had on our lives. Well, same is true when we're talking about the Bible. When you're talking about the way people do things and why they do things, oftentimes when they hear the truth, when people hear the truth, uh, it gives them a, a, a start, you know, and startles them or scares them. And here's a good, some good examples of this. For example, in, in Luke chapter 4, Luke 4, 16 uh, through uh, 22, we're going to look at this. This is uh, an occasion where Jesus is actually uh, preaching. He's, he's speaking in the synagogue. And listen to what the Bible says. We're in Luke chapter 4, uh, chapter 4. I said chapter 4, verse 16. Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance uh, to the captives, <coughs> to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to again to the minister, and he sat down, and the eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fast upon him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled, this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bare him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Now they were impressed. They were sort of astonished, if you will, that, hey, here is, uh, this is Joseph's son. You know, he's just a, he's just a carpenter boy a carpenter's kid, and uh, he's basically saying that these are the words of, of God that are revealed, uh, you know, that, that are now uh, read in our ears, and how is this even possible? And so 
They were astonished at him. But look at it again. In Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2 and verse 12, now listen to the reaction. When people are hearing the rest of the story, if you will. Uh, and immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth upon them. Now let's back up uh, a verse or two. Uh, Mark 2 and uh, we'll verse 10, just as Jesus healed in the lame man. He said that you may know the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of uh, palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, go thy way into thine house. And immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Now, friends, just a little side note here. If people say, if people can do miracles like they claim to today, there would be a lot more of this going on. People just being amazed and saying, I never saw it in this fashion. But you know what? You go to any of these so-called faith healers and you see the same fashion. You see it the same thing, all over, same thing. You know, somebody waving their hands and people falling out on the ground and, you know, so-called smitten in the spirit and this, that, and other, and people that have internal diseases and problems are cured and no one ever uh, has really seen the evidence of, of the uh, sickness the outward manifestation of it. And so it's all, you know, it's all smoke and mirrors, really. But when Jesus does something, people are immediately, immediately get well. Lame people immediately stand up, receive strength of their ankle bones and, and uh, uh, take up their bed and walk. And people are just amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw in this fashion. So when Jesus explains to them, look, this, uh, uh, which is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven or take up thy bed and walk. God has to do both of them. And so God has to be behind it. And so when he said that, and then he said, take up thy bed and walk, he basically telling them the rest of the story. The real story is Jesus is God. He is deity. He was doing things to be approved of by God. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. He was a man approved of God by the, by the miracles that he did. And so the real story is Jesus is deity. And he has power on earth to forgive sins and to heal. And so... There, there's, the, there's the real story. Look at Mark chapter 10. Mark 10 and verse 32. Mark 10 and verse 32. And they were in the, uh, in the way going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them and they were all amazed. And as they followed, they were, they were afraid. And he, and he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. So as Jesus is talking to the disciples, they're amazed, they're afraid. They have all this uh, these emotions going on when they start to realize all that's going to happen. You know, Jesus is revealing to them, look, I, I'm fixing to be killed. I'm fixing to go up to Jerusalem and the, the, the elders are going to take me and they're going to kill me, they're going to crucify me and I'm going to raise the third day. And they're like, whoa, wait, wait a minute. And so when reality sets in, people see the real story. People see the real story. And sometimes it scares them. Sometimes it shocks them. Let's look at one more. Acts Chapter 16 and verse 35. Acts 16 and verse 35. <clears throat> when it was day, now this is Paul and, and uh, Silas are in prison. When it came to, and it, when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. Now they've already taken Paul and they put him in, in prison. They've beaten him. And of course the, the, the earthquake happened and, and the uh, uh, doors opened and um, Paul taught the, the uh, Philippian jailer the gospel and he obeyed the gospel. But now they's coming and, and the magistrates say, you know, let these men go. And notice what? The keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul that the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily. But let them come themselves and fetch us. All right, let them come themselves and, and fetch us uh, out. And when they came, uh, they came, they besought him. And when the sergeants told these words to the magistrates, they feared when they heard they were Romans. They heard the real story, the rest of the story. Whoa, wait a minute. We be some people that were Romans and we didn't condemn them? Ooh, we can get in trouble for that. You know, we violated their, uh, their, their uh, citizens' rights. And so the real story oftentimes puts puts fear and, and trembling in, in, people's, in people's minds, hearts and minds. And so that's really what we're trying to do tonight, friends. I'm going to give you the real story on why people do what they do. 
especially when it comes to this particular thing. Uh, we're talking about women preachers. You know, what's the real story behind women preachers? Uh, and I hope that if you're one of these individuals that are going to call in and say, uh, well, God can call who he wants to. You know, I hope that the real story will cause you some pause that will cause you to be, some, be afraid, really, uh, out of what the reality really is. Because it may be that you've never heard the real story or the rest of the story or why this all took place. You've been taking it at face value that this is okay, but you've never stopped and considered what the Bible has to say about this matter and never stopped to consider whether it was really true or not. Now, when, when we hear about women preachers, we, we hear all kinds of excuses and reasons why it's okay. But let's talk about this. Why, why is it okay for a woman to preach? What's the real story? Well, some would tell you what well, the real story is. See, women, men are so sorry. Men are so sorry that the women, they have to preach. They have to stand up. They have to be the ones that, are, uh, uh, that get up and preach and do it all because men are so sorry. Some, some will say, well, the real story is God called them. You know, God can call who he wants to. Others say, well, you know what? God's no respect of persons. I mean, you know, everybody's one in, in the eyes of God. God's no respect of persons. I mean, after all, Paul said, there's neither male nor female, neither bond nor free. All are one in Christ Jesus. And so, hey, it's, it's okay. That's the real story behind it. Well, friends, I, I suggest that I suggest we look and see what the real story really is. Let's consider what the Bible has to say about this matter, and let's see if, they're, if these are just arguments or quibbles, if they're excuses or poor reasoning, or, you know, is it the real story? I submit to you that the real story is yet to be told. Now, let's take, for instance, men are sorry. Well, men are sorry sometimes. Some men are sorry. But that doesn't give you the authority... That doesn't give you the authority to do what you're doing. All right, now think about that. Someone said, well, men, men are just, they're, they're just uh, sorry. And so that we have to do it. You know, friends, think about that for a minute. Think about that. You're basically saying that the real story as to why women should be preachers or, or can be preachers is because men don't do what they're supposed to do. Now, let's think about that. If someone doesn't do what they're supposed to do, does that give you the right or the authority, the permission to do something that is wrong too? I mean, hey, let, I mean, let's, let, let's use that reasoning. You know, if one child comes to you and says, hey, you know, uh, one, one child tells on, on, on their, their, their brother or sister, hey, you know, little, little, little Timmy over there, he didn't... Uh, he didn't take out the trash and he didn't feed the feed the, the pets like he's supposed to. Therefore, therefore, what I'm gonna do, says little Sally, since little Timmy didn't do his job, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna disobey mom and dad, and I'm going to do I'm going to go play in the street. Friend, just because someone else is doing wrong doesn't mean that you have then the authority to do something that's wrong. Where does God give authority to someone to do something because someone else is sinning? You see, that, see how reasonable that is? Look, just because something is, is not authorized doesn't mean, or just because someone's not doing what is authorized doesn't mean that you then can turn around and do that job even. See? I know in my house, sometimes we give chores, we give specific chores to individuals, and if, if one of my children says, well, you know, uh, uh, the oldest one didn't do her chores, therefore the youngest one comes on and says, well, I'm going to do her chores and not do my chores. No, you, you, don't, you don't just get to arbitrarily come up and say, hey, I'm going to do what I want to do and neglect what I'm supposed to do. Now, here's a, here's a biblical example of this. In 1 Samuel 13, verses 12 and 13, let's put it up on the screen here. 1 Samuel uh, 13 and verse 12 and 13. Now, Saul is waiting for Samuel to come down and offer sacrifice. He's afraid the Philistines are going to attack. He's afraid because uh, Samuel's not coming down. <clears throat> Let's back up to verse, verse 10. It came to pass that as soon as he had made the... Uh, no, let's, let's back up a little bit more here. 
uh, verse 8, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But, saw, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul is sitting here. He's waiting for Samuel. And Samuel hadn't arrived yet. And Samuel says, look, I'm going to be down, I'm going to be down there in seven days. I'll be there at Gilgal, seven days. Well, the seventh day rolls around. There's no Samuel. There's no Samuel. And the people are getting antsy. They're, they're leaving. They're running away from Saul. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, of the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. Now, friends, I don't know. I've never really offered a sacrifice like this. But I suspect, I suspect that if uh, uh, Saul says to bring the burnt offering, and he's brought the burnt offering, and then this uh, uh, sacrifice is made, and you know the fire is built, and the sacrifice is, is offered upon it, I suspect that's going to take a little time. So what that tells me is on the seventh day, Saul thought Samuel should be here by now, and therefore, I'm going to go ahead and offer this sacrifice. Knowing that Samuel still had, let's say, half a day to get there. And so Saul takes it upon himself. Hey, I'm going, to, I'm going to do something that I'm really not authorized to do, but Samuel's not here to do it, so I'm going to do it. And lo and behold, he gets done doing it, and here comes Samuel, the man he should have waited for. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattered from me, and thou camest not within the days appointed. Uh, excuse me, I'm here, right? It's the seventh day. Did I get here on the seventh day? So really, you're saying, well, well, you didn't get here on time. Well, I said I'd be here on the seventh day. So why is it that you went ahead and did it? Now, if the eighth day rolls around and I haven't showed up, now you can say I didn't get here on time. But I said I'd be here on the seventh day, Saul, so why did you offer the sacrifice? You should have waited for me. Well, he said, I saw, I saw you didn't come when you're supposed to. And, and the Philistines are, are, are gathered themselves together at, at, at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. <clears throat> now, friends, this is exactly what People say when they say, well, men are sorry and men aren't being the spiritual leaders that they should be, therefore, we're going to go ahead and do it. Friends, just because you, just because you're in a situation where the, the people who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders and are supposed to be the ones doing what God says, just because they're not doing it, that doesn't then give you the right to go ahead and do it. Just ask all. Saul said, well, Samuel, you know, you're not doing your job. I'm going to do, do it for you. I forced myself to do it. Yeah, I like the way Saul, if you just read Saul's life, you know, he, he got some pretty good, uh, he comes with some pretty good excuses. You know, he, he, he words them in such a way that, boy, he can just put the blame on anybody but himself. Later on, if you read in chapter 15, he says, well, you know, the, the, the people, the people kept the, uh, the best of the flocks, you know, they did it. You know, they did it. He always puts a blame. Samuel, well, you weren't here on time, Samuel, so I'm going to do it. Friends, is that really what you want to believe? Is that really what? Is that really the answer you want to go with on women preachers? Because the men are so sorry and don't do it, and therefore you have to do it? Is that, is that really where you want to go with that? All right? <clears throat> Listen, just because God uh, said this is how something's going to be done and the people that are supposed to do it don't do it, that doesn't give you the right to do it. That doesn't give you the right to do it. Now someone says, well, well, God called them to preach. God calls women to preach. Listen, friends, God calls people a certain way. Now, I know that people say they're called to preach, and they think that God, they heard a little voice here, and that uh, you know, God telling them, oh, you need to, you need to, you need to get up and preach. But listen, here's what the Bible says. Here's the real story. The real story is this. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. Paul says, Wherefore he called you by our gospel. Now who's he? Who calls people by the gospel? 
Well, it's God. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and of the uh, belief of the truth. And then he says, wherefore he called you, excuse me, he called you by our gospel. So it's God that does the calling. God does the calling. Now, if God is calling a woman to preach, then we ought to be able to hear God make that announcement somewhere in the Bible. Here's the announcement. Here's God's announcement about who he wants to preach. Now, if I can find it in the book here that God calls women to preach, then, then I can say, yeah, God called women to preach. But God calls people by the gospel. And if you listen to something that's not in the gospel, you're actually not going to God. You're actually being called away from God. For example, look at uh, Galatians, Galatians 1, verse 6. Galatians 1, 6, Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that hath called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. It's not like the one I'm telling you. And when you listen to something that's not like what Paul gave you, Paul says, when you listen to something that's not like I gave you, you're actually being called away from God. Okay? All right, we've got a phone call. <clears throat> you're on the word from the Lord. Hello. Have you ever heard of a man named Ronald Coins? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, about 35 years ago. Uh, uh, okay, does this, uh, this have to do with women preachers? Sir? Does this have to do with women preachers? No, it has to do with a while ago when you mentioned about Miracles. Okay. All right. Well, let, we were All trying right. to stay on track here, so let's. Uh, I, I'll just. I'll give you a few. I'll give you a minute to make your point there, and then we'll. Then we want to try to move on. Okay. Go, okay. go ahead. Um, Bassett, Virginia used to have a theater, and about I'd say thirty-five years ago. Um. This man, his name was Ronald Coyne. When he was a young boy, him and his brother was uh, playing around, and they was pulling these old-timey suspenders, and he had one eye knocked out. And I've got the record album. The name of it's When God Smiled on Ronald Coins. Okay. okay. He brought, he came to the, to the theater when it was there, and he claimed that the eye that was not there, that he could see out of it because God, um, Okay, so in other words, the eye he lost, he could still see with the eye that he lost? Yeah, because God was creating this miracle. Okay, now here's my and question. All right, let me stop you right there. Here's my question. How did, he, how did he prove that? How did he prove that that was true? Well, I was in the audience, and of course, down in the front, area, there were people that was with him, and that was who he would call out right. with different things for him to read, and I was sitting middle ways up, and I told my friend, I said, you know, I told you this was one of these fake people, right. you know. right. And, of course, some of his people, I guess, heard what I said. And they called me down there and told me, said, give me something of yours to read, and which I did. 
and he read it. And for a very long time, I thought oh. that I had seen a miracle. Okay. But you really hadn't, right? And I found out okay. that he had a plastic eye. Right. And... So it really what he really wasn't he really wasn't doing a miracle, was he? It was some kind of trick. Right, right. Um, well, and that's what we're saying. Them. All these all these miracles that that people so called do today, these so called miracles today, they're all just tricks, con men, basically what they are. And so uh, the only way that you can confirm that something is from God, if someone tells me that I can see through an eye that I don't even have, then you're going to have to demonstrate that. Do a, do a miracle, a notable miracle, that can, that can verify that. In other words, give me something from God that I, can, that I can say without a shadow of doubt. No man can do this except God be with him. And so, all right, well, listen, I'm going to try to move on with my lesson, okay? So okay. I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate you calling. All right. So, yeah, those stories, you know, we dime a dozen. That, that's what everybody says. Okay, now. Though Paul is saying, you know, someone says, well, uh, women women are called to preach. Well, Paul says you're called by the gospel. You're called by the gospel. Well, if that's the case, then show it to me in the gospel. Show show me in the the Bible where a woman is called to preach from uh, from, from the Bible. If God called a woman to be a pastor, then show it to me in the Bible. But you know what I can find in the Bible? What I can find in the Bible, I can find actually just the opposite of that. I can find in the Bible that God calls pastors, but he never specified that they're supposed to be a woman. Look at this. In 1 Timothy 3, in verse 2, 1 Timothy 3, in verse 2, here we go. Now, <clears throat> this is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good, he desires a good work. Now, let's do a little uh, teaching for a moment. Now, this word bishop... This word bishop is the same word, or it's referring to the same thing as an elder. All right, a bishop is an overseer. A bishop is, a, is the same as a presbyter, same as an elder. Uh, we can go to Acts chapter uh, 28, or Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, and you'll find that Paul called the, uh, the uh, elders from Ephesus, from the church at Ephesus, and he called them in Acts 20, and uh, let's just get up here, Acts 20 and verse 17, real quick, do a little quick study here. Acts 20, verse 7, Paul called the elders of the church. All right, here's the elders. Now notice what he says to them. Let's come down to verse 28. He called the elders, and he says to them, Take heed therefore to yourselves, elders, and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. That's, that's the same word for bishop. Same word for bishop. God hath made you, the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers and your job is to feed the church of God. That word feed is the same word for pastor. So pastor, bishops, overseers, those are all the same as elders. And Paul says in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 and 2, that if a man desires the office of a bishop or desires the office of an elder or desires the office of a pastor, he desires a good work, a bishop or an elder or an overseer or a pastor, then must be blameless the husband of one wife. Now, friends, there's no way in the world that a woman can be the husband of one wife. Now, you might say, well, the next thing they're going to do the, the homosexual crowd, what they're going to do, they're, they're going to try to redefine marriage. Well, now you've got to redefine the, the, the uh, participants in marriage, right? Well, if you've got two women who are getting married, somebody's going to have to be the husband, right? So now we've we got, we got to redefine the words. So it's not possible here. God has specified that a man is supposed to be the pastor, the elder, the bishop, the overseer. Now, there's no way a woman can be a pastor. Not unless you do like the homosexuals and try to rearrange, try to change the definition. So all these women on, on TV, Joyce Myers, 
right? Uh, Gloria Copeland and all these, all these Joel Osteen's uh, wife, whatever her name is, Victoria. all v Victoria, yeah. Uh, all these local, all these local pastors had to explain this. You know, where in the Bible do you have a woman even remotely meeting the qualifications of a pastor? She can't be a pastor. Francis just can't be. Now, that's the real story. So somebody says, well, well God, called her to be, God called her to be a pastor. God didn't call her to be a pastor. If he did, you could find it in the Bible. See how easy that is? Now, when you know the real story, when you know the real story that God never called someone by the gospel, never called a woman by the gospel to be a pastor, which he specified is supposed to be a man, then it ought to shock you and say, wait a minute. You mean to tell me I've been believing all my life that these women are pastors and really the Bible says they can't be? Friends, that's the real story. I, I'm reading the real story right out of the book. See? Now don't get mad at me. I didn't write the book. I'm just reading it. A woman cannot be a pastor. I don't care how sorry men are. A woman still cannot be a pastor. Okay, so the rest of the story, well... It can't be because men are sorry. It can't be because you don't have the authority to be one anyway. You can't, you can't say, well, God can call who he wants to. I've heard people say, well, God can, call, God can call a mule. You know, God spoke by a donkey. Well, there's a lot of people that are just as stubborn as a mule when they say a woman can be a pastor. And just because God spoke by a donkey don't mean, doesn't mean people have to make a donkey out of themselves and go against what the Bible says. Okay? Now, someone says, well, what about this, James? What about this? Well, the Bible says neither male nor female. See that? Neither male nor female. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, let's look here at uh, Galatians. Galatians 3 and verse 28. Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, no distinctions are made in the body of Christ. No distinctions are made in the body of Christ. That's what they say. Now, friends, you know what? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Now, the men, those sorry men, now, they may let you have that. They may agree. Oh, yeah, Galatians 3.28, yeah. Women can preach because there's, you know, there's no distinction made in the body of Christ. Male and female, there's neither male nor female in the body of Christ. All right? Well, why don't we back up to... Ephesians chapter 5 and ask them the same question. Ephesians 5.25, those same sorry men that will let the women be the so-called pastors that God never called and said has to be for a man. Those same sorry men who will let the women preach, you know what they'll say? Oh, no, the husband's head of the wife. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Right? Husbands, head of the wife. Verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands and everything. Oh, no distinction is made, though, right? Neither male nor female in Christ. Who's the, head of, who's the head of the family? Now, any man that's got any, any uh, manliness left in him, he's going to say, oh, no, the husband's the head of the wife. The husbands had the house. They're going to say, oh, I wear the pants of my family. Oh, wait a minute, though. There's neither male nor female. Neither bond nor free. You're going to overlook it when it comes to preachers, but you're going to, you're going to lay down the law and insist that the woman submit to you when you won't even submit to God, number one, and you don't care about her submitting to God. You're going to let her be a pastor. You got it backwards, my friend. You're okay for her not submitting to God's will, but you're not going to let her fudge the line when it comes to submitting to your will? You must think you're better than God. You're going to give her permission? You're going to give her permission to, to uh, uh, do something that God says she can't do, but you're not going to give her permission to step over the line when it comes to you? 
See, friends, that's how backwards, that's how backwards it really is. The real story is, the real story is God never authorized these women to take on these roles. Now, listen to how some people say it. Now, this is clear from a good while back. This is uh, oh, the old uh, BTW uh, television station here, you know, uh, behind the walls, uh, bewitching the watchers. can't remember how they exactly uh, say it here, but uh, what it stands for. But uh, let's just notice this. Let's notice their... Uh, Let's, let's notice their reasoning here. Why women can preach. I don't like five o'clock go to your, your street sometimes. You give us a call. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, and you, and so you're a minister. Yes, sir. Yeah? Yes, sir. Uh, tell me, uh, I have to ask you a question. How do you stand on women ministers? Well, <laughs> I, 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 no, no, no. no. I, I would, I would, uh, I would refer you to uh, Philip the Evangelist, yeah. who had four daughters, and all four of them prophesied. Right. And prophesying was more than just predicting the future; it was also the fourth telling of the yeah. word of God. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't have a problem with uh, with women in ministry. I no. do, I do believe if, if if it's something that would be uh, of a pastoral nature, that there yeah. should be the covering. Of, of their husband. Uh -huh. uh, I believe there is to be a covering that should be in place. But there are awesome ladies that are, are missionaries and teachers, and, and, and I've been with lady pastors as well, who had a covering of their, their husband who actually took care of the administrative and the leadership roles of the church behind yeah. the scenes and freed her up to preach the word. But I think when we look at the New Testament church and we see Philip with four daughters who were full of the Holy Ghost and could prophesy, yeah. Okay, so Philip had four daughters that could prophesy, and as long as Philip gave them permission, boy, they could do these things. You know, a husband takes a leadership role behind the scene. Is that like leading from behind? You know, is that what that is? Friends, let me ask you this. Is it possible? Is it possible that a, that a person can give authority to someone to do something that God didn't give him authority for? And let me ask you this about Philip's daughters. You know, do, does Philip's daughters, did they teach over a man? See, I don't have a problem with saying Philip had four daughters that prophesied. The Bible clearly says that. But the question we have to ask is this. Did they violate what God says a woman can or can't do? when it comes to their teaching or their prophesying. In 2 Timothy 2, look at this. This is what Paul tells Timothy. This is what Paul tells Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. Now, how can a woman teach over a man and not be an authority over him? And how can she do that and not violate what Paul just said? Now, I was talking to a, a, a minister the other day, and he said he belonged to a church that has a man and a woman pastor. And when we were talking about that, he said, well, he said in, in 1 Corinthians, because I asked him about 1 Corinthians Chapter 14, where Paul says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it has not permitted them to speak. He said, Well, that's like a business meeting. <laughs> I said, No, it wasn't a business meeting. The context of 1 Corinthians 14, they were all together in one place. If you look back at, at chapter 11, they were in one place for to, to worship, take the Lord's Supper. They were doing it wrong, they were abusing it. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, they were all together in one place to worship. So this is not a business meeting. Now how can a woman preach when Paul says, no, keep silence in the churches? Welcome to the program. Hi, James. Hey. Uh, I heard a, a lady one 
time she uh, she said that it was okay for her to preach because of uh, women got the equal rights years ago, and she was trying to she was trying to put that into the Bible. Well, I'm glad I'm glad that that uh, uh, man finally corrected what God messed up on so many years ago. Don't aren't you? Yeah. E- equal rights. It's just I don't know. Well, that, that that that's again. You know, people people will say uh, uh, church and state in some cases, and in some cases they say no, you can't mix church and state. Right. It's just whatever fits. Right. Their, uh, exactly right. Uh, way. We want the state to do the job that we want done as long as it's you know what we want to do. You know, we if it. If it goes against what God says, but we want it, then that's fine. Yeah. Right. Any other time, we want to keep it separate. Uh, As far as uh, movies and stuff, what's your opinion on the uh, Hollywood programs like uh, Christ and uh, Jesus of Nazareth and all of those? What's well, your uh, view, or, or have you seen them? Or? No, I haven't seen them. I, I mean, I've seen some of them, but... Uh, I'll quickly answer it so we can stay on topic here. But uh, I say when, when most time when people pick up the the Bible and make a movie out of it, they mess it up. You know, okay. when it comes down to movies like but, Noah oh, or right. uh, whatever, the Exodus or the Ten Commandments, whatever, the best thing to do is read the book. You know, the book is always right. better than the movies. And that's pretty much true with any book that you read. So uh, I, I think a lot of stuff people see on TV and everything, that's where they're getting... Uh, I think you're right. Wrong. I, I think you're Fresh right. They never open the book and they Appreciate find it to it. find out what the truth is. That's right. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks for your okay. call. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's look at this. In Acts 21, in verse 10, if 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 Philip's daughters could prophesy, then let me ask you this. Why did Agabus have to come down? And as we tarried there many days, now he's at Philip's house. As we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus, not a prophetess, but a prophet named Agabus. When he was come unto us, he took, Paul, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and, uh, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now why did Agabus have to come down to tell Paul that there were four prophetesses that could certainly could have gotten a revelation from God and gotten the message from God and given it to Paul. You know why he had to come down? Because it is not permitted for a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over a man. And so God sent a man. God sent a prophet. Not a prophetess. And so when people say, well, you know, I think, I think it's okay. Well, that's not the real story. Listen, just because your husband or your boyfriend or your granddad or your father ordains you or permits you to do something, that doesn't mean that God says you can do it. See, men get it just backwards. Men get it just backwards. And, and, and here's the women saying, well, the men are so sorry that we have to do it. Well, where'd you get your permission? From the men? Now, think about that. Men are so sorry that we have to do the job that men won't do and we got our permission to do it from those sorry men. You know what? If those sorry men gave you permission to do something that God said you couldn't do, they indeed are sorry. They're sorry more ways than one. Yeah, those men, they're sorry dogs. They're just sorry dogs, and so, but we have to give our permission from them to do this. Well, what you need to listen to what you need to do is listen to G-O-D God, not D-O-G dog, men. See, just because somebody comes and says, well, you can do it, that doesn't mean God said you can do it. And it's beyond me why people would say, well, we're going to get our permission from men and the very reason you're doing it because the men are so sorry. So what's the real story? Well, the real story is just like this. The real story is just like this. Jeremiah 44 and verse 15. Jeremiah 44 and verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burnt incense unto other gods 
and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the Pathros, answered, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word of the Lord, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of the heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off, <clears throat> but since we left off, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings to her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. See that? They say, well, we stopped, we stopped doing things wrong and we, uh, we, we were punished for it. So we're going to do, do things wrong because now we'll have uh, food and so forth. They're associating, they're associating their error uh, with, with the trouble they're in. Now notice this. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drinks offerings to her with, without our, our men? All right. And the incense she burned. Uh, then Jeremiah said to all the people, to the men and to the women and to all the people, which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings, your princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not to his mind? So that the, wor that the Lord could, not, could no longer forbear, could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. Because you have burned incense and because you have sinned against the Lord and you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor statutes, nor in his testimonies, therefore this evil has happened unto you as at this day. The evil didn't come upon them because they stopped worshiping uh, falsely or incorrectly. The evil came upon them because God finally said enough is enough. And it didn't matter if they continued to worship the, the queen of heaven or not. They were going to be punished for disobeying God. And so the real story about why women can preach is because like these people, they knew what God said. They knew what God wanted and they said, we're just not going to do it. We ain't going to do it. That's the real story. That's the real story. You know, Jesus made this, asked this question. He says, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why is it that people will turn around and say, yeah, we, we, we love God, but we're going to turn around and have women preachers, women pastors, in spite of what God says? How you can say you love God when you willfully disobey him? And I, I'd, I'd challenge anyone, i challenge anyone to, to call up and give a scripture. Why is it a woman can preach? They always have to change something. Well, that was a, that was a first century context. Well, show me, a, show me a scripture in the Bible that's not a first century context. Show me one. Show me a, show me a verse in the Bible that was not written in the first century. In the New Testament. Show me a, ver a verse in the, in the New Testament that's not written in the first century. So you can't say, well, that was just, that was, that was that time period. Well, friends, it was all that time period. So if you're going to say, well, that doesn't apply today because that was back in the first century, then you have to say that about the whole Bible. Is that really what you want to do? You might as well do it because you've already thrown out one part of it. Shouldn't take much for you to throw out the rest of it. See? See? The real story, the real story, friends, is people just don't really love God. In John 14, 
In verse 15, look at this. John 14 in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, friends, would you please give me an explanation about why it is you're in a church that has a woman pastor? Well, why is that? Now, I know we've kind of been using these terms interchangeably. Now, a pastor is not necessarily a preacher. Those are two different things. But you know what? A woman can't do either one of them. A woman can't do either one of them. She doesn't have the authority to preach or teach over a man. 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. And she certainly doesn't have the authority to be a pastor when the Bible clearly says that a pastor is supposed to be a man. So why is that? Why, why do people do it? I'm going to, um, got just a few minutes here. I want to, uh, before we close, I want, to, want you to listen to uh, Brother John Shannon give some commentary on, uh, on women preachers. Here he is right here. See, people have her acting like a fool. But see, you do just the same thing. You show that you don't really love God by being in a church that's not in the Bible, by worshiping God, contrary to what the Bible says. Now, why is it? Now, why is it that you will say, you know what? I, I, I think we ought to go by the real story. Let's get what the Bible says on this matter and then turn around and let women be preachers or you have instrumental music. See, things that are contrary to what the Bible says in other areas. Friends, all we're talking, all we're saying is you need to make sure that what you're doing is really in accordance with the Bible. Make sure that what you're saying and doing, what you're believing, what you're following is really in, in keeping with what God said. See, the real story, the real story about women preachers is the same story, the same real story about anything. People just don't care what God wants. But friends, we do care. We care what God wants. We care about what it takes to please God. Jesus said, I always do those things that please the Father. Friends, that's the kind of people we want to be. And that's the kind of people we want you to be. We want you to be the kind of people that are always concerned about pleasing the Father. Don't be like those who would say, yeah, you know, women can be preachers, pastors, bishops, rabbis, whatever, evangelists. And it doesn't really matter because God can call a rock, he can call a... He can call a donkey, therefore he can call a woman. Friends, don't, don't be that. Don't be that person. That just shows you really don't care. That's the real story. But if you really care, you'll obey the gospel and you'll become a, a New Testament Christian worshiping God the way that God wants you to. And if we can assist you in any way, the members of the Church of Christ want to do that very thing. Here's how you can reach me. We're going off the air. Here's how you can reach me. 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. Come examine the church of the Bible. Come meet with the people who care what God has to say and do the things that God wants us to do. Till next time, friends. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Real Local, WGSR 47.1 in high definition. this hour and we have a lot of rain coming down in downtown Reedsville. Yes, a steady rain all day and it's coming down as we speak. So we'll take a look at the forecast coming up in just a few moments. Star News on Matt Smith will be here. He'll give us an idea of what we can expect for tonight.